Hello art lovers, this is Gordy Grundy with ArtReportToday.com. Once again, tonight we present our Spotlight series, where we turn our attention to the hardworking folks in the arts media. As you well know, Art Report Today is primarily and proudly an aggregated site where we bring you the finest arts and culture news from around the world. All on one page, Art Report Today offers a deep, beautiful dive into the very best. Tonight we shine our spotlight on Artillery Magazine, based in Los Angeles, California. Like an obsession, I've been fascinated by Los Angeles since I was a kid. I grew up in a small SoCal beach town less than 50 miles from LA. Every morning the Los Angeles Times mysteriously appeared on our doorstep. The iconic gothic logo of that robust newspaper promised something important, something alien and valuable. Los Angeles was everything. The wonder and awe of Hollywood, a romantic pioneer history of tragedy, fame and great fortune. Even the crime and mayhem had a stylish edge. And all of it was layered in sunset gold and hidden behind the bright glare of spotlights. Fine art has a fascinating history in L.A. Obsessive and highly innovative. Talent gathered here. The Hollywood craftsmen did their job by day, busting out and expressing themselves by night. Ideas took hold. Aerospace and new technologies kicked the local fine arts into overdrive. Light and space. Finish fetish. California pop. Tonight we shall focus on Artillery Magazine, a 15-year-old venture that has survived economic depression, recessions, and media meltdowns. Artillery is the premier art magazine in the city. With great pleasure, let me introduce the editor-in-chief. Tulsa, Kenny is the editor of Artillery Magazine, the founder as well as the current... Well, you're, uh, Tulsa, are you the publisher right now? Or are you? I am. You are. She does everything. And uh, we're going to focus on artillery a little bit later, the history and then their origin story of, of the magazine, because you're in your, what, 15th year? Correct. That is quite an accomplishment in a town like Los Angeles. I've seen any, many mart, art magazines go, and this is, uh, this is quite, quite a step. Well, you're established now, I guess. I guess so, so. But before we kind of get into you and the history of artillery, um, let's kind of focus on our two guests tonight, which is Zach Smith, who's a senior writer and columnist of Decoder for Artillery, and a little bit newer writer, but you've done many pieces, Julie Schulte. So uh, Tulsa, could you maybe introduce Zach to us and we can chat with Zach a little bit? Okay. Um, Zach? I met through uh, another a writer of artillery who wanted to um, interview Zach as an artist. So uh, I, I became. I think he was an artist in residence in a Bay Area. Okay. So uh, anyway, I ended up wanting to interview him too, and um, I think he just finished uh, his Whitney. He was at the Whitney with his gravity rainbow illustrations or i probably said that wrong uh, the thomas pynchon novel is that right anyway so i interviewed him i thought he was fantastic smart i love his art and uh it turns out he is a writer too so i said would you like to do a column and he said yes and then i told him how much i could pay him and he said no and, and he said that was <laughs> because that's peanuts so we came to an agreement. It's still peanuts, but anyway. Uh, so I feel like he is really, you know, contributes quite a lot. And then we decided on Decoder because uh, we talked about how, you know, the art world is, you know, this world that likes to be, you know, about mystery. And so we, you know, came to that. And uh, so he's been writing for us ever since. He hasn't ever missed one column it's hugely popular and uh, a joy to work with and a great artist wow what can i say you've said a lot well oh. zach tell us hello and and uh what are you thinking what are you doing hi um yeah i uh i we settled on a on the column decoder because i i feel like conversations that i have so often with people who either 
people who are interested in art, but they're not artists or people who are artists, but they, you know, they haven't gotten, a, you know, aren't showing a lot or uh, people who are in one part of the art world, but they don't really know what it's like to be an artist or is basically just like a lot of confusion about what all the things are like, and they're, and they're all kind of assumed to be normal, you know, like, Oh, you know, you, you have a show and every, you have a show every year or a year or two years. If you don't, then something horrible has gone wrong. Uh, the show has a press release. Usually your gallery will write it or you will write it. Or, and one of whoever doesn't write it will complain that it sounds ridiculous. And then you have to keep rewriting it. It has to say certain things in it. Uh, not because anyone thinks those are important things to say, but just because that's what press releases look like. When you have a museum show, then there's wall text. Who writes the wall text? Where does it come from? And there's, and, and there's just like, there's no, I mean, even after, I don't know how many years of art school I went through, nobody really ever explained like, what are these little rituals and, and requirements and assumptions that people have? And I wanted to just sort of make a column about those things. And then in the beginning, I did almost just that. And then after a while, I started to branch out because, you know, you run out of, you know, simple things to explain. Um, but, you know, I explained, we, I did one about what it's like to, you know, try to work during the pandemic uh, by interviewing my friend, uh, Joanna, who is a like, young working artist, uh, trying to do that. Um, and talking about, you know, the, fun the relationship of, you know, press to you know an artist's career and things like that so it, it just sort of it my idea is that's an all-purpose explainer you know yeah well you do that's a good, good job of it and i also want to say that zach Thanks. you do all your own illustrations for every article too don't you that's new i do now uh, oh <laughs> yeah I, uh in the beginning i would just do them and then tulsa first we had kind of traditional art direction where there'd be a photo or something or the artist that I was talking about. And then after a while, we had a cartoonist who did separate work. But right. then after a while, Tulsa was just like, well, why don't you just do it yourself? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. Ad Reinhardt used to do little cartoons that looked nothing like his paintings, you know? Oh. Um, and so I thought, you know, I would do that. Like, I'm not really, um, even though like my work has a lot of heavy black lines and stuff, I'm not really trained as an illustrator. And the big thing about being an illustrator is being clear. Um, like clarity is kind of the main, it's a value that fine art, as you may have noticed, never has. Um, clarity is not the top of the mm -hmm. most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so even though I, I knew a lot of the tools of illustration and I, I didn't really, making the picture clear enough that people go, oh, it's, you know, it's this is, you know, it's a little bit of a challenge every time just to. It's a, it's a small picture, but yeah, it's, it's like just slightly different than my, my, my normal way of thinking when I started picture, but yeah. Well, it adds a nice signature. I like it. Me too. Do you still pay him peanuts for those two, Tulsa? Well, I gave him some money for it. That's enough. That's all it needs to be discussed. It's the honor. I mean, I like peanuts. I'm like a circus elephant. <laughs> You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Well, arts writer is a very prestigious title, but yeah, it's peanuts. Yeah. <laughs> but is. also, like, the more I found, I mean, every writer you ever interview on here will say, the more, the larger, you know, if you get paid a lot, suddenly what you have to say is very restricted. Mm -hmm. Because that just happens. And, you know, so, like, Artillery is not, you know, it's not writing for Vanity Fair, but it is, I, I never get an article killed, you know, like I, nobody ever says we can't publish that, we'll get sued. Um, and uh, so a lot of times, a lot of writers, you know, if you look up the history of, uh, uh, you know, Truman Capote, like any writer, Henry Thompson, anyone who, you know, made a career as a writer, they often have like a steady gig which, you know, is, it pays peanuts, but the point, but mm -hmm. you get the more direct communication there alongside things that are, you know, sometimes, you know, more extensive, but they're, you, you know, they're more someone else's vision. You know, Tulsa doesn't tell me what to write about. And, uh, and so it's kind of direct line in, 
And I'm just happy, you know, I'm happy to have a place where that is what happens, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, thank God it's not Vanity Fair, you know. Except for he would have liked the money. And I would like, and I just want to insert right here. I would definitely want, I would love to pay more. I would love to pay more. But for some reason, you know, advertisers don't take this into account, you know, that, hey, we have to pay our writers. Hey, we have to pay a printing bill. Hey, we have to, I mean, you know. Oh, they get to write what they want I'm to write about, gonna, uh, you know. I'm not going to put my publisher's hat on during this time, okay? <laughs> You know, a well, uh, scrappy hey, little art magazine is going to have scrappy little art magazine profile. Yeah. You know, that's, that's yeah, absolutely. Goes, you know? Well, you know, we're on the subject of, of writing. Let's introduce Julie Schulte. Julie, you've been with Artillery for almost a year right now, isn't it? Been a little over a year. I, um, I was assigned my first piece um, right before lockdown. So, yeah. <laughs> You can commemorate that experience with artillery, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, tell us, tell us how you found Julie. Well, um, Emily Wells, who is an uh, associate editor for us for a couple of years, she's on to bigger and better things right now. She's got a book deal. I'm so happy for her. So, uh, but Emily brought in a couple of new writers, and I am was thrilled with the new writers she brought in, and Julie is one. So Julie, I know, uh, knows Emily through uh, grad school, correct? Yes, that's true. Yeah, right. And uh, she's great. So uh, very good. I like the subject matter and uh, very meticulous, very uh, great writer, and I feel very fortunate to have her on board. No, nah, she's very thoughtful. Julie, you're very thoughtful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe to a fault. <laughs> I'm a slow run. <laughs> well, that's, you know, why we do it, so. <laughs> well, now, your, your, your current piece on artillery right now is, is a, a fascinating piece with Emily Barker. And I really yeah. enjoyed reading that. Thank you. I really enjoyed interviewing her. It was really, really fascinating. Yeah, Julie is a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Emily's a disabled artist that um, it's just another lifestyle we can't really imagine. How did you, uh, Julie, how did you come uh, become familiar with her work? And the last work that we, you know, we saw, the, you know, her, I guess it was at Murmurs in L.A.? Yeah. That yes, that was that looked amazing. Yeah, that was at the end of 2019. Um, and right now she's working on building, you know, an accessible space for herself. So that's sort of, but it's been an extension of that project. So, you know, she worked with the 3D imaging and um, got really comfortable with that. So, yeah, I think she's focusing on that and then getting back into art. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting to, to talk with her, um, you know, I suppose about really, I mean, what she's doing. I mean, it's a complete extension of the life she's been living for 10 years. And so, I mean, it was so much more about, um, you know, her beliefs, her advocacy and things like that. So I, I became familiar with her to go back to your question, um, actually through Instagram, um, through, you know, these posts she was making that had, you know, a lot of theory and a lot of just really interesting dialogue. and. I reached out to her and she was really open to talking with me for a few hours on the phone and that, yeah and <laughs> that's that's about it but I, I I didn't see that show but I I did know about it but um through social media was how I, I got in touch with her and she's oh. always been an artist I'm sorry Gordy I just no. wanted to ask that question has she always been an artist I yeah, mean, she she went to art school, um, and yeah, she has been, and she had an accident about 10 years ago. So then, you know, the nature of dealing with um, the repercussions of chronic illness and the accident, uh, you know, has, of course, shaped the way she's made art and the way it's become more collaborative. And, um, uh, well, yeah, I mean, she does excellent work, and I'm so yes. glad that we got to kind of expose her in the magazine like that. Yeah, yeah. I also think like the hard thing about doing, I don't know if it's hard, but like the thing about doing an interview like that is you want to give the artist the chance to, to talk and you have to kind of be egoless as the interviewer, yes. you know? 
and that and the interview like there's there are only a few questions but they're the right questions you know yeah and well, set thank her you. off thank you. yeah it was it was difficult and i i mean if you've read my work um anyone listening <laughs> um i often write features and um but it felt really important to do an interview although i don't come from a background of interviewing people um it felt really important to give her the space and not try to do something I normally do as both a fiction writer and, you know, an essayist, which is have my own spin on things. It felt like the less of me, the better. <laughs> so. Absolutely. As an interview, if I go back and listen to my, uh, you know, if you do a recording and you, you know, are transcribing and anytime I hear myself, I'm like, would you just shut up? <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. You know, so I understand that, yes. Yeah. That's a delicate process of trust. And, I mean, one thing that um, was really interesting and, and nice was I, I told her from the beginning that she's been getting a lot of press recently, and she had just had something come out, I think, in the Huffington Post where – you know, she really took issue with the title, um, uh, like make art accessible. And she was like, make everything accessible, you know? And, um, and so she reposted, you know, this feature on her crossing that out and, um, and correcting it. And I was, um, you know, I was very conscious of that and that she, some of some interviews, you know, she'd been asked questions like, I don't know. And I, I kind of brought it up. I said, you know, I, I only have four questions um, and, um but that's because i've already been reading all these things and i sort of i want to give you this space and she said um you know it's difficult to sometimes be asked things like um i guess she was asked recently like what's left you know what what do we still need you know as far as accessibility and disability rights and she just felt like that shut the interview down for her like she didn't want to speak anymore and so i mean it feels important to, to do that kind of work before. And um, I don't know, but I, I did feel being a little vulnerable with her and, and sharing that, like, I, I've, I've done these things. Here's what I know. And I really, <laughs> and here's what I'm curious about, you know, um, I think kind of softened her and pointing, celebrating her for actually correcting a piece. Um, I think actually kind of, made it a more friendly environment, you know, and, and made it more of a discourse rather than just, you know, here are some questions and now answer them and goodbye kind of thing. Right. Did that she is... see the piece, uh, Julie? And yeah. Did she, did she give you, I should definitely send her some magazines, by the way, but did she, <laughs> <laughs> did she see it? And what yeah, she her? did. Yeah. yeah. She, she loved it. She was really, really pleased. Um, so she reached out to me after and, um, you know, has been reposting it. And um, I, I, was, I was happy and I've gotten quite a bit of feedback from it. So, and actually we were quoted, um, well, not we, she was, <laughs> but our article uh -huh. was quoted um, in, a, in a meme recently. So that was nice too. <laughs> Great. Cool. Good, good yeah. for you. And good Feels for like her. Huge yeah. mouth. For us all. <laughs> I, I assume that was over the phone with COVID and all? Yeah, it was over the phone. Right. Mm -hmm. um, as an arts writer, we like to interview people in person so we can get that extra verbal. And so, right, yeah. right. Yeah. But yeah. When possible. Yeah, but it's better than email at least. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course, you can't cut and paste. <laughs> right, right. So, I think that, like, one of the like the medium that you use for the interview is so it determines so much. Like if you do an audio interview, like, okay, we're doing this, right? People are going to walk away. Their impressions walking away are, Oh, I like that person or I don't, you know, like, mm -hmm. or I don't remember them. That's right. the impression you get from audio in real time. And even a panel, Whereas, like, with a text interview, you walk away with quotes. You know, you're like, oh, this thing, I remember this thing that this person said once. And so I think that you kind of want to think, well, what's my end format for this interview? You know, and that you could kind of, you know, sculpt how you deal with people around what, what people are going to get in the end, you know? Right. 
Well, so you're saying uh, a real, you mean a real interview versus uh, an e email. Is that what you were uh, trying to? Well, I mean, in an email interview, sometimes you really just need someone to be able to say their things, right? So sometimes right. email is a good thing if, if your final product is, if your final product is like, okay, let's say you're interviewing someone who you don't think has ever gotten a chance to speak before, you know, like they haven't been heard from. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the email interview is good because they can write their little essay, you know, and people can hear right. their point of view. But it's often good to, it's often good to go, well, where does this go? Who's reading it? You know, like, why is this, you know, is this a column in, in artillery? You know, is this a feature? Is this informing a feature that I write? Like, interviews aren't just one thing. They're like a whole, there, there's a, they, they, they serve different functions, almost like, you know, there's many different kinds of interviews as there is different kinds of writing or essays. So I think that, you know, even though we want to do things in person and like you talk in person and you transcribe is definitely like the, the, the best, mm -hmm. sometimes you really just want to nail down a specific issue that you really, you know, like, I want to get to the bottom of this. And sometimes that's just a matter of, especially with someone who hasn't had a chance to say their own piece. Sometimes that is just like, here, here's an email question. Write your little, you know, eight, eight paragraph essay about this idea. And then I can ask another question once I've let you, you know, let it all out, you know? Well, but right. Then, I mean, I think people in real life, like there's a lot of people that like to avoid press, for instance, right? Because they say, oh, you always get it wrong. You always, uh, I mean, there's many people that avoid press because, and also, I mean, like one of the persons, I was so thrilled to interview John Waters. You know, I'm like, right? I'm like, this is fantastic. Oh my God, this is great. But I realized he had it down, what he was going to say and what he wasn't going to say and what he had pat answers and he, uh, you know, he was very cagey in a way. And maybe, like you say, if, they, if he had an email and answered it, he would maybe have actually even opened up more. Who knows? Maybe. I Probably. find that, like, experienced people with, like, long careers behind them, they've been burned so many times, or they've just been edited, you know. Like what they, they say a long answer and then it gets edited down to like one sentence. Right, right. They, right. When I yeah. interview people who are really, really veteran, veteran people, they have a spiel that they give everyone. Exactly. Like, and they will return. Exactly. And in the way you do a really good interview with them, one hopes, is that you break past all of those things without upsetting them so much <laughs> exactly. that they feel you know what I mean? like that's a, a delicate balance it doesn't with younger artists like mid-career artists they're like yeah oh, i love to talk someone's listening to me thank god yeah but with older artists they're like in the in the village voice said this about me in 1984 and then i had to deal with this in spin magazine in 1992 and then i had to deal with this in the time and you know they're just like don't say any like have a thing ready and they say it and and you have to i think the only way to build trust with someone like that even if you know them personally, the only way to build trust as an interviewer is to just keep talking and then say things that are smart, that they hadn't heard, heard of before, and hope that they recognize that and go, oh, okay. Yeah, yes. I've never, like, when someone go when an experienced, like, creator goes, I've never been asked that before, that's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a go. You know? Right, right, definitely. And now, Julie, most of your articles and artillery so far have been profiles, right? Yes, yes. So uh, do you agree? I mean, I mean, maybe this isn't like, do you think like, oh, maybe I'm a, a good interviewer or maybe I'm, a, is that something you kind of like to do? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I've, I've become really curious about that never seemed a possibility. I mean, I'm shy. It seemed, it seemed actually um, not in the realm of possibility maybe five years ago. But I think from, you know, well, depend. I mean, with the features I've done, I, I wasn't always able to speak with the artists since they've all been, you know, during COVID. So with uh, my piece about Isabel Albuquerque, I did 
that show review um, with some stuff about her that I had researched. And then she reached out to me and then we ended up having a dialogue, you know, over the course of a month about things that I had had said in the article and, and talking about book recommendations and stuff like that. So I'm starting to um, be more interested in that and, and how that can work. And I do, um, I liked your comment, Zach, about the more seasoned veterans because I um, had an opportunity maybe two years ago to talk with David Sally, but before I was writing about art, but I did want to talk about some things and everything I had brought up um, you know, sort of was like, don't believe what you read, you know, or like they like, you know, they reduced me and, and this sort of thing. And so um, I think uh, the ability to, I don't know what I would like to do is kind of cultivate um, at least if I have any sort of name to anyone would just be that I'm interested in discourse, you know, more than anything, rather than trying to get something out of someone, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, and that, I, yeah. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that, um, that, yeah, that I, I think I preface, you know, when I, when I interviewed, um, Yasmin, uh, Diaz about her, her soft powers exhibit, I, you know, I told her, I mean, I was learning so much from the art and I was, you know, interacting with the pieces, um, and, you know, had done a gallery round before I got to talk with her and then she walked me through and, you know, I, I, I was interested just to learn more and I, um, I don't know if that helps or not, but it seemed like I didn't have an agenda. So there was, um, a different kind of, I don't know, rapport that was shared. Um, but maybe I'm also choosing people. I feel I might be able to share that. I mean, it feels somewhat, you know, an intimate exchange that, you know, if we're sharing, this dialogue and um yeah that was a very yeah I, I think yeah oh, i was just gonna say that the thing of like being interested in discourse is i mean i i, I tend to think like once in a while i back up right and i'm like oh i read a column for an art magazine and then i you know i read something in, in another art magazine you know and it's like we talk about art so much like everyone talks about art so much and what is the, the end result of all this talking? Mm. And the thing is, like, I think in the end, the art world is one of the few places where everyone has talked so much to so little effect that they realize that they actually just like talking. <laughs> like, you like being able to... Sh like, like, when there's a film, like a big movie comes out, right? And everyone has a conversation. That is a conversation about the future career of every director and actor in the movie, right? Like really what we're saying is, was this a dud? Should Hollywood ever give this person money again? That's not what we think we're saying about the movie, but that's what the people who made the movie are thinking, right? <laughs> right. In the art yeah. world, there's really, like, the, 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 the vital question for the creator is, did I get press or not? You know, that's it. Um, and hopefully it was good, but, you know, that, you know, but there was press or there wasn't. But we also know that all the hundreds of things that we said about the grid and the gaze and the color and like yellow is the color of hatred and whatever every fucking thing everyone said since the 1970s about art everyone's forgotten it and they'd only remember in art school for like a week to write a paper and then they forget <laughs> but really what we're doing is we're talking to people who have similar interests about things we like you know like the art world's discourse has been so hypercharged for so long that i think people now have realized on a certain level like yeah, we, do, we talk about these things because that's part of the, the interest of them, is that we have a personal reaction and we want to be like, is this what everybody else is feeling? Like, let's talk about art. And I think that in some ways that's, you know, in some ways it's depressing because it's hard to make change when everyone's just talking to talk. But on the other hand, it's freeing because there isn't this feeling of an, the judgments aren't harsh and aggressive. They aren't, they aren't going to, they aren't final. Everyone, everyone agrees they're kind of semi-final. Everyone's trying to, trying to push their, find their way through. And I think that, you know, when you really, like saying that you're discoursing to discourse, you're talking to talk is, it's kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs>
Like it, it's kind of a it, it, in a way that almost you, it's almost there's almost there are very few subjects you can talk about these days where you're just talking to talk and not to like defend the patch of ground that if you lose it you'll die. You know, like mm-hmm. like I don't talk about politics with anyone I know because we all agree about everything. <laughs> what else are you gonna say? <laughs> you know, like yeah. the president was a psychopath and now he's not a psychopath, but he's just a guy. Like that's great. Like that's all. There's nothing to talk about. There's no discourse about politics it's just it's a very it was very black and white whereas art is like oh this guy painted a wolf with a red sun and then he painted on side of a wall and then he has his mother upside down floating with wings and it's like we don't that's not a life or death conversation thank god you know yeah yeah that's a good point very well Tulsa, I want to kind of interject a little bit about the history of Artillery Magazine, because it's pretty spectacular. But we'll jump into that, then we'll start talking about the next issue, because I know both of you guys are all, well, all three of you are working on something interesting. So, Tulsa, 15 years ago, how in the hell did you start Artillery Magazine? Well, I mean, it's kind of an old saw, I think, at this point. But anyway, um, you know. <laughs> it's an experienced I, pattern. Yeah, really. I just felt like, you know, that there was not a magazine uh, out there at, uh, in L.A. And, uh, you know, everything was uh, from New York. And also there were, you know, you would get an art forum or Art in America and you'd look for, uh, there's nothing about L.A. here. You'd even look for reviews or whatever. And I knew there was a very, very, you know, uh, vibrant, uh, L.A. art scene. I mean, it was real obvious that L.A. was really kicking ass in the art world. You know, we had a lot of, I mean, that was in the 80s, you know, and L.A., you know, Helter Skelter came out. Every, I mean, L.A. was kicking ass in the art world, and it was like, why isn't there a magazine? So that is really basically why I started, but then also I didn't want to start a very, an academic magazine because that's just not me that's not my style and I also wanted a very accessible magazine you know I wanted an art magazine that was accessible so uh, you know I mean they had a coagulator around and I didn't want exactly that but I liked uh, Matt Gleason's kind of approach and he was very irreverent but I knew I probably couldn't get advertisers like that, too. So you have to have a business mind about it, too, you know. I mean, so um, I wanted to do kind of something in between there, you know. And uh, that's what happened. And my late husband, Charles Rapley, was, um, you know, had a lot of experience in the publishing world, which I didn't. But I had the experience in the art world. So, um you know, I kept telling him, he thought I was a natural editor because I'd done some editing and um, he, he thought the idea was great, you know, and he said, I'll, I'll help you start a magazine. So we were the co-founders. We started the magazine. And then Charlie kind of, he's always a big champion. And, uh, and you know, it's really actually hard to go on without him in a way. He was such a champion. But, uh, and a big supporter, but um, anyway, you know, he was there for the publishing side and the, uh, all that. So, you know, I kept, I'm still going on with it and um, I don't know, I guess it's, it seems to be, you know, still thriving after all these years, I mean, these years, so. You make it sound so easy. Well, it's not, and I didn't mean uh, that. I mean, also <laughs> owning your own business, you don't really make any money. Anybody that owns their own business knows that. And, uh, you know, we still, like, kind of struggle. I mean, the pandemic kind of set us back a little bit. But sure. uh, the art world is kind of getting back on its feet. The L.A. art world is really, like, gangbusters, you know. So I think it's coming around, and... Um, People well, are still very supportive of artillery, so. Well, I mean, you've survived, say, Gary Kornblau's excellent magazine that was kind of privately funded. And then is Art Issues still going? That was, again, art, kind of... Art Issues, no, that's gone. That's um, gone. So, I mean, you've kind of... Extra, you're the last man standing. 
Well, a little. I mean, there's Carla's out there, extras out there. Sure. And uh, I guess there's, you know, there's always room for more uh, art magazines, you know. We should probably just all put, put it together well, and, and make our own art forum, in my opinion. But whatever. <laughs> I don't think we need that. But, you know, well, I mean, I Los know that's the thing. We don't. <laughs> Well, you know, Los Angeles has always been the, the ugly step stepsister to New York City, you know, the, the art capital of the world. And in the last 15 years, I think every artist in New York has moved to Los Angeles, and so it's kind of emptied that well. And Los Angeles is kind of the, is the new royalty, and you're the, uh, you're the scrub. Well, okay. But, well, thank you, Gordy. Now, I would think that uh, Zach might have something to say about that being, I mean, Zach, you are from the East Coast. I mean, I know you're from Washington, D.C., but you spent time in New York. I mean, I don't, maybe Zach wants to answer that because, you know. I think that there's a really subtle thing for me difference between New York and L.A. and that, like, in, L in New York, art is kind of part of all the intellectual activity of New York, uh, including like publishing and journalism and all that. And in LA, art seems more like part of all the attempts to have fun of LA. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, I don't like the, 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 op there's no place in New York where there's art openings that are like Super Chiefs art openings. Like, oh. Super Chiefs art openings are party. They are parties. People have fun. Like, people are like, oh, let's go to this art opening because we will have fun. Whereas in New yeah. York, people are like, we go to the art galleries in Chelsea because we have to. Because <laughs> otherwise, no one will know that we are smart and have glasses. <laughs> well, and, and they have to like, be seen. It's about I don't being think seen. That obviously, yeah. that's, an, that's an exaggeration. But it was something that... Like, as somebody who doesn't have, like, a lot of anxiety that, oh, no, what if someone doesn't think I'm smart? It did frustrate me about New York. It was like, yeah, I went to the opening. Like, it doesn't prove anything. It proves I went on the metro or subway, you know? Like, I had a dollar fifty. That, that's what that proved, you know? Like, <laughs> and it was frustrating for me. But uh, I don't know. Like, if Julie has never lived in New York, then maybe she has a whole different take of what New York seems like well, from now her point of view as a writer. Where's Julie from? I'm from Southern California, but I've actually oh, cool. been um, in like nine different countries. So <laughs> um, I, I ended up coming back here because uh, I teach at uh, UC Irvine. Um, but yeah, so I, I've spent time in New York, but I've never, I've never lived there. Um, so I don't feel I can speak very much about it, but my experience there sounds quite similar. And it is really fun here to, to the point that if I'm in hold of an opening or invited to an opening I never go really expecting to interact with the art I always go like on like a Wednesday like by myself <laughs> right. because, um, oh exactly Hammer I mean it's just a total are... social thing yeah. <laughs> exactly it yeah. is yeah this fascinating discussion continues in part two this has been a production of art report today Find your inspiration in the arts every day at artreporttoday.com.